Hello, welcome to our press conference. Snow measuring mission reaps big benefits for California. Um, we have four speakers today, and I'll just uh, name them in order in which they will speak. We have Thomas H. Painter, scientist and principal investigator at NASA Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena. Bruce McGurk, hydrologist with McGurk Hydrological Associates in Oneida, California. Jessica Lundquist, she's associate professor at the University of Washington, Seattle. And Bradley Dorn, deputy program manager with Applied Sciences at NASA headquarters in Washington, DC. All right, uh, good morning. Um, I'm Tom Painter with the NASA Jet Propulsion Laboratory. And uh, go ahead, Alan. Next slide. Um, so we're going to cover the, uh, an overview of the, the motivation for the Airborne Snow Observatory, uh, the demonstration mission from this last spring, this is the first, uh, implementation in reservoir operations and management, and implications for snow hydrology and glaciology as well as uh, the NASA directions forward. We'll start out with, uh, with our theatrical trailer. There's an enormous void in our quantitative knowledge of the mountain snowpack, and pressure is being put on us increasingly to be able to know that mountain snowpack because it is our primary resource for water. So when you fly over the mountains, you can see snow down there and no snow over there, but you have no idea how deep the snow is or how fast it's melting. The Airborne Snow Observatory gives you the information on every patch of snow as to how deep it is and how fast it's melting. And that's key information for water managers, for ranchers, for farmers, for boaters, the list goes on and on. The Airborne Snow Observatory is two instruments put together that look at the surface that tell us how deep snow is and how much sunlight that snow absorbs. And those two combined are what control how fast water comes out of the mountains and how much of that water comes out of the mountains from snow. We need a mission like the Airborne Snow Observatory because we very poorly know how much snow there is in the world's mountains and how fast that melts and comes out of out those rivers. The Airborne Snow Observatory is providing wall to wall complete characterization regularly through the snow melt season. So this is this is the future of of water management in snow melt fed regions. Okay, this is, this is your panel, um, who have already been introduced, but I also want to acknowledge uh, Frank who's here in the front row, nearly. Um, he's the chief of the California Cooperative Snow Surveys for the California Department of Water Resources. And uh, not only has he been involved with the funding of ASO, but he also is one of our flight operators, as you saw in the, uh, in the video. Next slide, please. Okay, uh, so as we mentioned, See y'all. 
hydrologist, uh, carbon cycle scientists at the intersection of the carbon and water cycles, atmospheric scientists, the control of snow on, uh, on uh, energy fluxes over vast distances, and then, of course, the water users. And globally, that's about one and a half billion people. And, and I just want to point out, this is the new cover of the IPCC Summary for Policymakers. What modulates glacier mass balance? Snow cover, uh, the addition of snow, and also the melting of snow. Next slide, please. So right now, runoff forecasting is handled from index sites. Few uh, patches of information here and there. We end up with forecasts that are not as good as we would like. So about 50% of the time, our forecast errors of the total runoff from April through July are 20%, those errors are 20% or greater. And about 20% of the time, those errors are 40% or greater. And part of the reason for that is the kind of information that we have. Here's Frank uh, up near Lake Tahoe. Next slide, please. So but this is the way we've been doing it for a long time, and it's incredibly valuable information. It's just relatively sparse. Next slide. So this is the map of snow tell sites across the western U.S. These are snow telemeter sites, snow pillows. And it looks like we have pretty good coverage all across the west. Next slide and then hit it one more time. So we zoom in here. This is in the Colorado River Basin. And uh, each of those little dots is a snow tell site. And each of those arrows points at a snow pillow that melted out the next week, losing all of that information, right? Leaving us with a very sparse knowledge of the mountains. And next. So as we mentioned in the video, there are two things that we need to know to understand the magnitude and the timing of snowmelt runoff from mountain basins. The first is how much water there is up in the basins and how that's spatially distributed. Right? That gives us the snow, that, that it comes as the snow water equivalent. The other is the albedo. So the absorption of sunlight contributes about 90 to 95 percent of the energy that goes into melting snow. Uh, in mountain basins. And so the albedo is the reflectivity. That's a measure of how much absorption of sunlight there is. So we've put together two technologies, scanning LIDAR that gives us snow depth. And with extra information, we can get the snow water equivalent. And then with an imaging spectrometer, which measures about 100 wavelengths of light or colors of light, we measure the, the reflectivity of the surface. Next slide. Next slide. Okay, and this diagram just shows that for, for you. I won't, I won't go through this in detail. So next slide, please. So the, the demonstration mission, uh, our first was this last spring. Primarily, it was in the uh, Tuolumne River Basin, which is, uh, Bruce will point out, is what the water we're drinking here uh, in the Sierra Nevada. This was on a weekly basis. You can hit that one more time. And that's above the O'Shaughnessy Dam. This is Hetch Hetchy Reservoir. The other part of this was on a monthly basis in the Uncompahgre Basin out here in Colorado. Hit it one more time. And that's above Ridgeway Dam. Um, so again, critical water supply. Next slide. And so the Airborne Snow Observatory now is providing in these basins these complete maps wall to wall of the snow depth at about one and a half meter spatial resolution. 460 square uh, miles here. And then zooming in here, you can see the incredible detail. It's information that we've never had before. Next slide. And then one more time. So we'll go into the results. So this is the transition of the distribution of snow water equivalent across the spring, across the entire Tuolumne River Basin. And you can see this diminishment of the snowpack. But it's happening in ways that we had not understood previously. OK, next slide. So what we just saw, so that, that was across April 3rd to June 8th. We watched the complete time variation of the spatial distribution of snow water equivalent. We saw the snowpack water volume drop from 218,000 acre feet down to 15,000 acre feet. Um, which is enough water to supply more than 200,000 families for, of four for a year. 
Um, and that, we watch that go through that transition. Next slide. And one of the most important parts of the Airborne Snow Observatory, and especially in meeting the water management needs, is processing of those data in less than 24 hours. So making it a timely distribution of data. Now, we pull off of the plane about a terabyte of data and crush that into two maps of about four and a half megabytes, which can easily be emailed, but have the most relevant information that we need for the runoff understanding. So next, we'll transition, next slide, to Bruce McGirt to talk about applications. Thanks. Um, I'm really glad, delighted you're here and uh, welcome you to San Francisco. Next. You all woke up this morning and water was probably on your mind, either tea or coffee or that shower. Your water came information from snow courses, snow sensors. I had uh, some runoff forecasting models that I used. Uh, since the inflow to Hetch Hetchy on normal and wet years is well more than it can store, I also could order releases from the front of the dam. Uh, so it's a complicated operation, but a real clear goal was, next, to not be in this situation. If you look at the top left, you can see those reservoir drum gates way up there with all that bare soil between the water level. Uh, this was the first caused the Dust Bowl. The second caused every reservoir in California to be at an unprecedented low. Hetch Hetchy Reservoir was there too with about two weeks of water left for the San Francisco Bay Area. So your shower and your coffee water is at jeopardy at this point. Uh, this is what I as a reservoir operator never ever wanted to be part of and I need good information to avoid that. Next. So here's reservoir operations. Starting about April 1 through the end of the snowmelt runoff, every day uh, a reservoir operator is balancing his forecasts uh, With the ASO results, we have something that we've never had before. No reservoir operator has ever had those simple blue bars in the lower left of this plot. That's the volume of water standing up there on that mountainside as snow. It's, we, we've never known that before. We've had a few points here and there that we used in index equations to 
make a forecast of runoff, but to be able to actually know how much was there and then watch the, reserv watch the, the snow reservoir up on the hillside diminish through the season with these ASO flights while the operators balanced the fill on that green line so as the snowpack disappeared on the lower right, the reservoir reached full. And simultaneously, we were generating power and providing a perfect uh, reservoir operation with minimum releases when we didn't want them. Next slide. I built a model. It's one of four that's now being used to help operate Hetch Hetchy Reservoir. Forecast, forecasters and operators don't rely on just one tool. They like to have multiples because a lot is at stake, the very least your job. Um, but the top left dashed line was the model prediction of what the inflow to the reservoir would be. The uh, points below it uh, were the observed. So the model was doing very well. Uh, we came up to June 1st and I took the ASO results that measured the snow in the mountains, plugged them into the model, and overwrote that uh, amount of snow. The top line right, red, was what the model forecasted before that. And it was pretty far wrong, some 32,000 acre feet wrong. The minute I put in the ASO results, the model corrected itself and much more closely tracked the uh, observed inflow. Uh, and with this tool plus the other tools that the reservoir operators were using, they achieved a perfect operation. The reservoir filled to the brim. They managed to generate the maximum amount of hydropower water supply for you this morning was assured because the reservoir was full and it was a, a marvelous combination. Next. So ASO data improves so many things. Reservoir operators are just desperate to have that kind of information. Uh, Hetch Hetchy was a, was a perfect operation in a 50% of normal year. It was a dry year last year, uh, bad pet snowpack, uh, and yet it still reached full. We generated $3.9 million worth of clean hydropower that avoided that extra power being generated uh, by uh, uh, fossil fuel, and it was just uh, an incredible thing to have that kind of data and see things that we'd never seen before. So uh, there are other people who are really excited about new data, and that would be uh, somebody like Jessica Lundquist from uh, University of Washington. Thank you. May I have the laser for you? Okay. Next. All right. So this is a picture you're looking at here from the Gaylor Lakes Basin looking out over the Tuolumne watershed. Um, and we've been, the reason why scientists are excited is we've been trying to figure out what's going on here for years with almost no information. Next. So for very simple, um, the Sierra are primarily granite, so in some ways that makes for an easy hydrologic cycle. Um, basically you start with precipitation, both snow and rain falling out of the sky. You end up with snow on the ground, the snow melts, and you get stream flow, right? It seems like an easy thing to do. Um, Start talking back to me? Okay. <laughs> um, so, so here's a picture of Tuolumne Meadows, as you may have, some of you may have seen if you drive across um, Highway 120. And we've been trying to figure out, you know, the ecosystem, the water supply, all depends on that stream flow. Next. However, when you think about even these simple set of equations, precipitation in the mountains is hard to know. Um, what you see here on the left is the number of stations as a function of elevation on the x-axis. And you can see that as you go up higher in the mountains, there are fewer and fewer observations. Why? The picture on the right shows you what happens once you put your instruments up there in this healthy Sierra snowpack. Um, they, they don't survive very well, and um, poor Frank has to go fix them all the time. Next. 
<laughs> snow, by the same token, is also hard to know. And um, as Tom talked at the beginning, we're relying on just very few point measurements. So here you see a picture of snow pillows, which are big weighing gauges that just weigh how much snow has fallen on them. Um, manual snow course measurements. We, California has a very dedicated team of people who go out and um, poke holes in the snow, figure out how deep it is. And then satellite images, which you know, show you where snow is, but you have no idea how much is at any given location. Next. So when we try to model this, um, as Bruce showed you some models, um, here's an example of a model we've been running at the University of Washington. You have a measure of that precipitation in the snow at one point. You then have everywhere else you want to know that, and you make your best guess and map that to the rest of the watershed. Next. Um, Typically, a hydrologic model is just that. You can think of it as being a bucket where we have rain plus snow. We have some loss of evaporation of the water back to the atmosphere. And then what we get out the bucket is the stream flow. And here you see in the black is measurements, and in the red are model simulations for one small piece. This is Tuolumne Meadows right here in the middle, and you see the white outline is um, Bud Basin, which is just one small piece of the watershed going down there. And this is model results. Next, please. Um, so this, some of the rain and the snow become that um, amount of runoff. But you see here as we zoom in for this basin, that at the end of the season, there's always more observed water than the model is showing. Um, that's you know, somewhat similar to what Bruce was showing um, for the larger Hetch Hetchy Basin. And what you see is that because we're guessing from a point, we're assuming precipitation increases as a function of elevation. But if you go up there and you walk around and you look at where snow is, um, you can see here there are two pictures in the lower left hand of this basin. And you see that this is not just a gradually varying field. This is very drastically different as you move across the watershed. Next. So if you get this data from the Airborne Snow Observatory, all of a sudden, you can start seeing that detail in a way that was never before possible. So here is on the right, what you're showing is a spatial distribution of what the model says the snow is. It's pretty smoothly varying, increasing with elevation. And on the left, what you see is the snow depth that was measured by those LIDAR pulses from the plane as it flew overhead. And so let me just show you a few features of why this is so exciting to see. Next, please. So you can see here um, on the top, that's Tuolumne Meadows, and here's a picture of what that looks like, obviously not on that day, um, but in the summer. And then up here, you can see this is a lake in Bud Basin. That's Bud Lake right up there. Um, and so you can actually start seeing in imageries of actual measurements the same thing you know when you walk on the ground. Next. You can also see that the LIDAR is picking up that this particular basin you might think, oh, you know, this is a plane, had some issues, there's weird stripes in it. Turns out reality has weird stripes in it, that it's measuring what's out there. And so you can see these huge fissures. So there's a fissure right there, and these red stripes here are really, really deep piles of snow. They're basically this fissure filled up with snow. And that's why there's more water in this basin all the time than we were modeling. We didn't have, you know, what looked like, you know, giant snow catching mechanisms. Next. You can also see um, we had a um, just digital camera up on um, Marmot Dome. This is actually put up there by Jim Roach, who's the park hydrologist for Yosemite National Park. And you can see it's taking a picture, looking down to a picture of Tuolumne Meadows right here. Um, and this is the April 10th photo. This is the April 10th LIDAR flight. And um, you can see the meander of the Tuolumne River going through the meadow. That's all snow. Next. Now what's really neat is that you can actually zoom in on these images. We're talking about resolution that has just never been known before. And so here you can see this exact meander bend is all covered with snow. Next, please. And we go on to a week later, April 21st. Notice that the snow is starting to melt in the meadow and there are um, spots where snow is disappearing. And you can zoom in again. Next, please. And you can see right here on the LIDAR image that exact spot where the snow is disappearing. You can also see Bud Creek, which I showed you coming into the meadow right there. Next, please. And one week later, you can see even more snow is disappearing. Um, next. And you can see um, it's gone there. You can see these opening big channels of water opening up all across the meadow. 
Um, it sees the forming of lakes, the last piles of snow. Next, please. Um, and so here, returning, going up the basin a little bit on April 21st, there's Bud Lake, and you can see these stripes, which are where those fissures are that filled up with snow. Um, this is, you know, just very preliminary results, but the, the exciting thing is these are new observations. It's a way we've never seen it before. Anytime you get new observations, you start new science. These models, we, we couldn't improve them because we didn't have the measurements. And now we can start seeing snow in space and time in a matter that's never possible before. Both at a very, very fine scale that's important for ecology and the larger scale that's important for the city of San Francisco's watershed. And these applications are just beginning to be discovered. And so I'm going to turn it over to um, Brad Dorn. We'll zoom back out to the bigger perspective of NASA and outer space. Thanks, Jessica. <clears throat> I'm Brad Dorn from NASA headquarters. I'm, my, uh, I'm going to try to answer the question of why NASA and, and why do we get involved in projects like this. And uh, first and foremost is the fact that are we addressing a national need? Is this a need that the nation has? And this obviously, especially out west, Understanding the water, water resources is critically important. But secondly, how we address it also is, are we making a connection from the science, observations, all, all the way down to the decision maker? And ASO is, is, has addressed this, and, uh, and you've heard all the explanations right here. But uh, one of the things that often happens is we do have a lot of good science going on and a lot of good uh, uh, observations going on, but those times when we can make that connection with the California Department of Water Resources, with those end users, and our information, uh, we, we look at those very strongly and we try to support those as much as we can. And, uh, and next slide, please. As you look at our constellation as it sits today, uh, one thing you'll notice, you hit it again, is that uh, we, we do value the water cycle. Uh, we're looking very strongly at it. Those stars indicate um, missions that are addressing the water cycle. Some, it's their primary mission. Some, it might be uh, just some of the observations are addressing it. But it's a very important part of our global Earth science mission. Um, the Airborne Sp Snow Observatory addresses one aspect that, that's quite unique, um, is that we're also exploiting the science that's developing those missions. And, and we do that often by testing our sensors, developing sensor technologies before and after the missions um, to either test the observations coming down or to develop the new sensors that are going into space. And this time, we've done a really good job of exploiting it as we're developing that technology. And we want to do that. We, we strive to try to get this technology and science down to the users faster and faster. Um, we, we just can't wait decades um, to get this information into our societal needs, into our decision-making processes. And if you go to the next slide, you'll see uh, our next mission's coming up. And you can hit it once more, and we'll get rid of Landsat 8 uh, that's addressed our water demand. But you see our upcoming missions, especially in this upcoming year, in 2014, we've got a precipitation mission and a soil moisture mission going up. So we're, we're really hitting the, the water cycle really hard, and, and we hope and believe it will uh, pay dividends. Next, please. And of course, if you just click down through these, Alan, uh, the science follows. And, uh, and the applied science follows. And, and uh, what you'll see here is we're addressing all aspects also, not just of the science and the water cycle, but of the decision-making process, which includes irrigation management, um, drought forecasting. And it also uh, stems to our global food security needs. All those items are extremely important to NASA and in why uh, projects like the Airborne Snow Observer Snow Observatory are so very important to us. And with that, I'll turn it back to Tom Painter. All right, next slide, please. Okay, just, just in summary, um, so the Airborne Snow Observatory gives us an unprecedented uh, view of uh, the mountain snowpack. Uh, already it has contributed to, um, to optimization of water management in California. Um, it also brings new science and new views into our science and our ability to pursue those questions in hydrology, climate change, ecosystems, and glaciology. Um, and finally, just I want to let you know that we're pushing towards statewide capability and ultimately 
we want to see this in space. But in the meantime, the airborne capability is going to fill that gap and that need. Thanks very much. OK, we're ready for questions. Any questions here? And please state your name and your affiliation. Uh, I'm Dave Perlman from the San Francisco Chronicle. A million questions arise, but is there any comparison between the economic economics involved in a statewide snow survey airborne versus a million guys out there plodding through the snow and probing the snow? So I think that's a, that's a great question for Bruce as well as for Frank. Uh, it really goes to Frank. I meant, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Frank, do you want to reply? Yeah, I think one thing uh, to address David's question, uh, the Airborne Snow Observatory relies upon the manual measurements and the telemetered measurements from the existing on the ground network the Airborne Snow Observatory gives us snow depth, it, and we derive the water content from the ground-based snow density measurements from snow courses and snow sensors. So we're taking a program that began well over 100 years ago and building on that and kind of carrying that into you know, its next phase. And the data that we derive from this approach we can't get any other way, irrespective of how many people you could possibly you know, send trekking out into the boonies. You just can't get the coverage. And one thing real quick, while I'm capitalizing on the mic here, uh, one thing that uh, Tom touched on briefly, but is also extremely important, is the idea of flying blind. In the Tuolumne watershed, we've got fully a third of the watershed area above our highest point of measurement. And we run out of snow on the pillows and still have a whole lot going hydrologically. And so the ASO gives us that ability to see above where, our, where we have the sensors located. And that's extremely important, especially in a big year. Yeah, and let me add some uh, dollars and cents. Uh, uh, once the lower elevation sensors have gone blind is when I'm most critically working to balance power generation and reservoir filling. I'm also trying to avoid spilling because oftentimes there are frogs and other amphibians downstream that would be adversely affected. If I can turn on a powerhouse a day earlier because I have more confidence in my information that $66,000 for the, a day for the powerhouse directly below Hetch Hetchy Reservoir. Now let's say it's 10 days or two weeks, we're getting close to a million dollars worth of clean power that can be generated rather than hedging, which is my defense against coming up short. So. That extra information has real extra value on its dollars value as well as a lot of other very desirable attributes. So. Hi, uh, Stephanie Agburn with Climate Wire. I had uh, sort of two questions. One is it looks like you're explaining this in California, but also, for example, the Colorado River Basin is a a key basin for many users in the West and even down into Mexico. And I saw that you did something outside of Ridgeway. I was just curious if you have any plans to expand that and also if you do get much use out of doing monthly flights instead of weekly. Um, and then my second question is, how do you plan to translate this into space? Okay, so um, yeah, we we're working in the upper Colorado River Basin and, um, and it's a slightly different approach. So in, in California, we partnered immediately with, with uh, Department of Water Resources to get flights going. In the, um, in the upper Colorado, it is, it is the federal government um, and so we're working with the Bureau of Reclamation, but taking it in a slightly different fashion, we're doing a value of information study, which is a simulation uh, study with them uh, to run through their modeling system with forecasters from the National Weather Service and the Bureau of Reclamation to evaluate these kinds of information. Um, 
However, we're working towards being able to have the funding this spring to um, to fly the Uncompagre above Ridgeway Dam um, on a weekly basis. Um, and uh, the, the technology investigation that we have done, we've, we've shown that, uh, that we, can do, we can fly this on a, on a weekly basis. We haven't yet evaluated in the Colorado what it means to back off to, uh, to monthly information. And because there was such heavy dust load there this spring, we lost the snowpack very quickly. So we, we got two acquisitions. Um, there, so it, that'll be a tough analysis on the the monthly information, and finally on on the transition to space. Um, so, one of the keys to that is being able to know that you can simulate the snow density information really well. And uh, we didn't go through that analysis here, but what we're finding is that that snow density doesn't vary much across the landscape at a time. And when it does, it does so in a predictable fashion. Um, it's the depth that varies a lot, as Jessica pointed out. And that's where the big variation in snow water equivalent comes from. And that, that nugget of information then allows us to target what we're going to do from space. Let's push towards a depth measurement. And that's, that's how we see this going. Uh, out into the future. And um, so being a part of NASA is a really, it's an exciting place and an exciting time to, to be attacking this. Um, still, it's, it's a decade plus, um, at least 10, probably 20 years before we can see a spaceborne mission that can do this. And so uh, in the interim, building out our capabilities with the, the airborne uh, capability, I think is, is the way to go. Do we have any other questions? Please identify yourself and your affiliation. Rich Monasterski with Nature. Can you tell me what the budget for this program was and what specifically is planned for next year? Um, and, and, and are there plans to expand it? I mean, you've got one, you know, one important urban center uh, in, in California, but um, you know, there's a lot of the West that needs this. Yeah, yeah. So. Um, so there was uh, strong JPL investment initially, um, and that probably was on the order of about $600,000 um, to ramp up the, the computing capability, which is what allows us to get to the 24-hour the turnaround and the full data system. Um, and then the flight and data analysis last spring was on the order of about $1.4 million. Um, and, uh, and about a third of that comes from the California Department of Water Resources. Um, and uh, then the plan is to head out over the next two years with, with similar funding. We're still talking. Um, and, um, and then at some point out in the next few years, we see that we, we're looking towards that transition to a, a west-wide capability. Um, and, and how that plays out between the state of California, where we're really working intimately right now, um, and the rest of the uh, western states is, is still in flux. But, um, but it's very active conversations. There are conversations going on specific to this at the Colorado River Water Users Association meeting in Las Vegas right now. Um, and uh, and it's, it's ongoing. Brad, do you want to? speak to that sure I can uh, one of the biggest challenges um, PIs like Tom and NASA has is how do we transition this technology and uh, one of the important things is can we develop a sustainable process and by sustainable um, you know is it cost uh, real realistic to end users to manage it over the long term and so part of that's technology you know can we make it cheaper, better, faster. And uh, the other part is the end user of, you know, do we have the right teams put together? And Tom just mentioned that. Of, uh, so we have a lot of work to do with the states, with the regional water authorities, with the uh, feds, you know, the BORs and the cores, you know, to try to pull those teams together, then to find a pathway forward for funding these types of things. Um, but you know, the, it's, it is important to know just because uh, you know we we would have a lot of applications out there if uh, if people just said, well, NASA will fund it. So <laughs> well, everyone's going to say, well, yeah, yeah, we can do that. <laughs> 
So it, it's important that we have these conversations and it doesn't happen overnight. Uh, and water users and water decision makers need seasons of proof to justify budgets then to move forward. So we understand that and, and, and we're gonna you know, do our best to keep that process moving forward, both on technology observations, but also on the interagency partnerships to have the discussions on sustainable funding. Let, let me jump in briefly on that. Uh, I've worked for both Pacific Gas and Electric as a utility and a very interested user in water resources and snow information and then the city of San Francisco. Uh, both of those groups are part of a very interesting organization called the California Cooperative Snow Survey Program, which Frank heads up. We all share in the budget for Frank's operations. Every one of the irrigation districts and utilities writes a check every year. That information to that group is money, and they're going to be interested once we can demonstrate that, in fact, this works. We can fly higher and faster with a stronger LIDAR instrument and image the whole Sierra uh, a couple times a month at least. I mean, that's, that's the goal. At that point, those groups are going to be saying, yep, it's part of the new program. We want in. We want that. Here's our check. So I see that coming along. Okay, we have time for one more brief question. Ned Rosell, Alaska Science Forum. I was just wondering who uses the power generated by the O'Shaughnessy Dam? That's an easy one. Uh, the city of San Francisco uses that power to run their hospitals, city hall, uh, muni, uh, libraries, so it's all uh, tucked into, it diminishes the amount of power that the city of San Francisco has to purchase from Pacific Gas and Electric. It's all used by the city. Okay, that was very brief. We can fit one more in. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we only take questions from reporters. Okay, it looks like we don't have any more. Uh, that's the end for this uh, presentation. Thank you very, very much for being here and for speaking, and thanks everyone for coming and participating. Our next press conference is going to be... Thank you. It's Sinoprobe, an unprecedented view inside Earth's largest continent. That takes place at 1130. Hope you'll be back then. <laughs>